Kids really do say the darndest things, and it's fun being a dad of an almost two-year-old because he gets so excited about what's going on in his life when he starts talking to me, and I really have no idea what he's saying. But I get excited with him anyway because that's just the way life is for us right now at our house. Oh, man, well, good morning again. So today we're continuing our series in Kids Say the Darnest Things, and, and last week Pastor Liz kind of brought into the discussion uh, this, this, this how we can help lay a healthy foundation with our kids in reference to God and his love for us and the things that he'll do for us and our worldview and things like that. I want you to know that today I'm kind of working through the lens of, of teenagers, uh, but I have two goals that I want to make very clear for you. Whether you are a parent of a teenager, if you are an aunt and uncle, if you have kids that will be teenagers someday, if you're helping in our youth ministry or our kids ministry, anything across the board in this room, if you're here today, these are healthy ways that you can engage teens in conversations when they ask tough questions. Because if we're being honest, we all have them. So here are my two goals. My first one is this. I want to help you understand that answering questions with teenagers, answering questions in your own life, it is a process. It is a process. It's very rare that you just come across and you just say, boom, there it is. Here's the answer. Let's move on. It is a process. It is, is a journey. And the next goal is this. I want to help equip you, church, into the discussion about how we can answer questions with our teens. So without further ado, let's jump in. I'm going to be working with ages 12 through 18-ish. And I say ish because there are some of us that are in this room today that are not 18, but we can probably find ourselves in the ish category as we go through some of the questions that I've been asked as a youth pastor. Uh, so last week, Pastor Liz went from birth through about 10 or 11 and some of the questions that they ask her in children's ministry. So this week we're kind of moving forward. And I got to tell you, the ages of 10 to 13 you remember this, parents, if you've got teens or if they're currently living in this lifestyle, those are some of the most literal years of a person's life. Everything is black and white. Everything is as you say it is. If not, then there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth at home. Uh, gray is bad because gray means that there's usually more questions that follow up the gray area until we get to a black and white. So we're in that, that kind of that in-between and then around the age 13, uh, a, a light switch goes off. Boom. The flip switches, and now they can start changing from just the literal answers of life and the way of life and just discovering things through um, their senses, through the scientific method, things like that. Now they're moving into understanding the world around them, and they're exposed to abstract thinking. They can start understanding that there are multiple perspectives that can be given around an answer. Sometimes to a question, there may be more than one answer, which then leads to more questions as to where those answers may come from. And so all these are different ways that, that as teenagers, you've lived it. You're Either you're living it now, you're moving through it, and all these different kinds of things through literal and abstract. And ultimately, it comes down to this. Some of the most difficult questions that I have ever been asked in life are from teenagers. I think sometimes as adults, we try to hold that part of our spirituality inside because why should we doubt or why should we have questions? And time and time again, when I explore my personal Christian faith, I, I learn over and over again that it invites us to explore. It invites us to ask questions and to jump in. And the best part about a teenager's curiosity is that they are genuinely curious. They want to know. There's no hidden agenda. They're not trying to pigeonhole you. I take that back. Sometimes these guys right here do try and pigeonhole me, but genuinely they just try to ask the question to explore. And I think this is the attitude that we all should have when, when coming before God with our questions. It's what Matthew 18, 2 through 5 tells us. As Jesus says, he called a little child to him and placed a child among them. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. See, church, we've got to be humble. We're not trying to pigeonhole God with our questions because he will outthink us and outmaneuver us every time. We've simply got to come asking the question. And sometimes our questions are asked differently. Sometimes we come completely abandoned and broken, and we say, why? And we hear nothing. Sometimes we come and there's a little more of a backstory to it and God intercedes and speaks back to us. Sometimes it's through his word or through a song or through pastors or through friends. Um, but we've got to be humble whenever we do so. 
As a professional Christian, meaning that I get paid to be a pastor and stand before you and speak today, I want to let you know that I have personally struggled with my own questions in life. I've run the gambits. I'm what you might call um, an intellectual. I like deep-rooted questions and deep thinking and deep discussions. Um, I also really enjoy the, uh, the area of Christianity called apologetics, which means that basically in, in every facet of life, I'm able to stand and defend my faith in a mature, kind, and respectful way. I dabble in that. I'm, I'm nowhere near, if any of you know, Ravi Zacharias, who leads Let My People Think and the things like that, the radio program. He is like above and beyond professional apologetic, but I, I kind of dabble in that. And I have to, because as a pastor, as a Christian who I know works with a very curious group of teenagers, they are going to ask questions. And I want to be ready to simply enter into the discussion with them. I want to help them explore. I want to help them learn. I want to help them grow. Those are all parts of it. So today, as we kind of journey in these next three questions, I want to let you know, I have a lot of ground to cover. Okay, I'm being very upfront with that. There's going to be a lot of information Feel free to take as many pictures of the slides that come on the screen as possible. I'll kind of cue you. Uh, they, they kind of build on one another, so I'll let you know when, when it's a full slide, probably take that photo. If not, you're going to get the same slide about six times each time with more information. Um, but just kind of follow along with me and, and imagine today, if you will, that I've got one main idea, and that's my goal, that I want to help you and equip you into entering the discussion, the process of answering questions. That's my goal today. I want to help you enter into the process of answering questions in your own life and teenagers' lives. And the second is this, is that there isn't just kind of one main idea that goes with each of these questions. It's like three little lessons that I've done with our own group. Uh, we do a series every year called Can I Ask That in our student ministry, giving them permission to ask any question they want. And then we stand and we get to answer those together. Um, but as, as we jump in with that, just know that these are three separate lessons I've combined into today because these are very relevant questions that our teenagers and probably even some of you in the room today are asking about God and Christianity and the Bible and things like that. So I want to jump in. You guys okay with that? Okay, here we go. Very first question that I was recently asked is, why is Christianity better than any other religion? I think it's a very fitting question for the time that we're in today. You can't help but look and watch the news or be ex exposed to certain conversations that are happening in the world and realize our society is becoming more and more pluralistic. Uh, and so, specifically, why is Christianity better? It was the question I was asked, but I'm going to tweak it a little bit because my stance went away from why are we better into why is Christianity the only true religion out there? Only true religion. That's my stance. Christianity is the only true religion. Now, religious scholars, scholars who study the art of religion, not specific to any certain one, but study religion, have come up with a list that each and every religion from Hinduism to Jediism, yes, there is such a religion as Jediism that worships and follows the ways of the Jedi in Star Wars, real thing, to Christianity, <laughs> there are certain things, there's a list that every religion has in common. So I want to start with some similarities, just so you kind of know the, the, the field that we're playing in here. Every religion has a form of prayer and or meditation. Okay, for us as Christians, we pray to God, we commune with God, we, we pray out loud, we pray personally, um, things like that. We meditation, um, quieting ourselves, focusing ourselves. Uh, the second one is this, ritual. Each religion has rituals. For us today, we actually participate in one of our rituals, that is communion. Now, we know it's more than just a ritual. There's symbolism there, there's remembrance there, there's worship there, but to the outside viewer looking in, it would be kind of weird for someone who has no context to walk in and say, why are you drinking Jesus' blood? Okay? That's across the board. There are certain things, rituals in religion, that people find confusing or weird and don't understand until they've entered into that religion. Baptism is another one. Someone might think it's funny that we're dunking people into water, and why? What's the reason behind that? Well, there's a purpose there. There's a reason there. Come join our community. We will fill you in on some of those things. The third one is this, community. Every single religion has a place that they gather together to meet and to have community. For Christians, it's a church. For Jews, it's a synagogue. For Muslims, it's a mosque. The next one is a set of ethical beliefs instead of ethical beliefs. For instance, for Christians and uh, Jews, it would be the Ten Commandments. That is a kind of a code of conduct for us. It's a set of ethical beliefs. And then finally, every religion has some concept of God or this higher power. For Jedis, it's the Force, okay? For we as Christians, it is God, the One, the Almighty. Um, so yeah, so now that we kind of understand the playing field, I want to talk about some differences. And first and foremost, I've kind of mentioned this, 
Christianity is unlike any other religion in that it invites you to explore. Each and every time that I've asked a question in my own life when it comes to asking my parents, asking my wife, asking friends, uh, other pastors, whatever the case may be, I'm invited to explore my faith, to discover what the answer is. Most other religions around the world, it comes to a point when when you start asking questions, there's a stopping point that says, well, that's just the way it is. And you kind of leave unfulfilled, like, well, why? We're curious human beings, so why? But I want to kind of look at a, a chart of the top five major world religions and show you what the religion is, the saving agent, or what it is that's going to kind of move them on in the afterlife, and then what the outcome of that agent might be. So let's jump in here. And again, if you're going to take a, take a picture, wait till the very end of this slide. First one is this. It is Hinduism, and the saving agent is karma, meaning that if you live a good life, it will yield a better life for you. And if you live a bad life, it will yield a worse life for you. When you reincarnate uh, and be in your next life, you'll climb the caste system. So if you are a Hindu, you want to do good to others so that when you die and come back in as another uh, human being, you will kind of work your way up the social class. You'll become a higher standard. Uh, so if you're born as a peasant, you want to try to make it up to middle class. And from there on up the ladder, you try to climb. Hinduism. So the next one is Buddhism. It is a lifestyle. When, when the founder of Buddha took off, he left his entire family. He abandoned everything that he knew and he loved because he wanted isolation to live these lifestyles that he came up with to achieve enlightenment or nirvana, meaning you get to escape the wheel of life. So basically what he was saying is everything you're in the middle of right now is cycle. It's cyclical. You're going to get trapped there unless you experience enlightenment to remove yourself a higher way of imagining the world, a higher way of thinking of the world, you can remove yourself and escape the wheel of life. The next one is Islam. They have five pillars, creed, prayer, pilgrimage, fasting, and zakat. And the outcome of sticking to these five pillars as best as possible is that in the afterlife, you'll be given a paradise based on your obedience. Ultimately, they are trying to keep God or in their uh, version of the religion, Allah. They're trying to keep Allah as pleased with them as possible. And in doing so, when it comes time for them to die, they will be given a reward. They do something good, reward, bad, consequence. Okay, you see the pattern there. Next thing would be Judaism. And then you have here righteousness through works, so obeying the law, doing the right thing. And when you mess up, you need an animal sacrifice to pay for that sin. And the outcome of the saving agent there is there's not really much of a context until the Messiah returns. They do not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. He came, he lived, he was a prophet, he was a man, no more. Uh, and that if you live a righteous life, the afterlife will work itself out. Hope you've seen some patterns so far. The last one, Christianity. Saving agent would be Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and grace, and the outcome is a relationship with God and eternal life. Now, I want to pause here because you've ever wondered what it is that sets um, Christianity apart from the other religions. It is right there in that bottom middle section. It is Jesus Christ. It is Christ. It is grace. Okay? This is why it is set apart. Every other religion, the saving agent falls back on the human being. Each and every person has to do something good or do something correct or obey the law and not do something bad. And when they do, there's a consequence. There's a consequence in the here and now as well as in the afterlife. First time ever in the history of world religion did God take on the form of humanity and pursue humans and entered their world and taught them what it means to live a, a life that is pleasing to God, to love, to serve, to worship, all these things that Jesus did for us. And the agent that was there was grace. See, Jesus, we, we have communion today. It's a beautiful thing. But Jesus said, I'm going to lay my life down for you. You deserve the penalty of death. I'm going to take your place. And that's what sets Christianity up apart from any others, especially as the true religion, because Jesus himself said it this way in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if you're sitting here today and you've ever wondered, well, what sets this aside? Why should I even be kind of uh, entertaining the idea of becoming a Christian? Well, there it is. Every other religion in your life, while you might benefit or reap good things, okay, no, nothing wrong with 
uh, living the four noble truths and the eightfold path. Uh, those are good things to abide by. They're morally good. But where does it get you? You're, it, all the responsibility is on you. You're bound to mess up. And Jesus comes in and says, I know you're going to mess up and make a mistake. My grace covers all. And that's the difference, church. That's the difference today. Now, if you're not like me and you're not someone who gets really geeked out about studying world religions, like I've made you this nice chart today. Uh, maybe you're like, where would I even begin in exploring that question with, with anyone in life, much less a teenager? Here's what I want you to understand today, church. A very responsible and appropriate answer is to say, I don't know. And to follow that up and say, let's explore that together. I've had to do that. It's very okay to look at someone and say, I don't know. And then let's explore that together. Let's dive into that together. I got to tell you, working with this age group right here, they, some of this is review for them because we talk about these things all the time and they know they can come up with me their questions, but their BS meter is off the charts. They know if you're pulling strings. They know if you're making stuff up. They know if you're lying. <laughs> you know why? They can look it up right here. <laughs> It's right there at the palm of their hand. So please don't think you can outsmart Google. What you should do is help Google help you. <laughs> Join in the conversation. Don't send them off to explore on their own, but enter the discussion with them. It's okay to say, I don't know, and move on. Okay, so this next one is kind of another heavy hitter. Um, and there's, again, there's a lot of ground to cover. There's going to be quite a few slides. It is, what is the difference between heaven and hell? So we're going to kind of break this up and talk first about heaven and three points there, and then second about hell and three points there. So if you're taking pictures, wait till that final third point comes up so you can get that. Um, but I hope that the discussion today helps debunk some of the uh, preconceived notions that we might have about heaven or hell that the world uses to, to influence us, maybe a skewed idea about one place or the other. Um, so we actually just did this lesson that I'm showing you today um, back in February in our student ministry. So I've kind of tweaked it for us, but uh, I want to jump in with heaven first, okay? Heaven first. So the very first thing you need to know about heaven is that heaven will be a place of newness. It'll be a place of, of newness. And I, we reference Revelation 21, 1 through 4. Let me read that for you. This is John seeing a vision from heaven. Here's what he says. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. It will be a place of newness. In the very beginning, when God created everything, after every day of creation, he said, It is good. Say with me, church. It is good. It's what God said. And finally, that little nasty three-letter word that we hate to think about entered in, and it was sin. Sin entered the world. And in doing so, everything in creation has been in this whirlwind, this massive storm of confusion and of mess and of messiness. And we kind of get, we're thrown off kilter. Well, John is telling us in this scripture, in the scripture, John says that there will be a new heaven and earth. It'll be new. See, ever since that moment, God had a plan to restore creation back to its rightful relationship and communion with God. He had a plan for it. Sometimes things were thrown out of, out of sorts, and Jesus came in to help make the way even, even better and even easier. But he's not saying that I'm going to restore heaven and earth to its former glory or its former creation or created state. He says, I'm going to make it brand new. So church, be excited by that because heaven will be a place of newness. Okay? All right. Second thing, heaven will be a place of joy. Be a place of joy. We look at 1 Corinthians 2 9 for this one. Paul says this However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no human mind has conceived the things God has prepared for those who love him. Okay, here's the best way that I can help explain this because, again, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no human mind can conceive, right? So, everyone, close your eyes for me, real quick. Just close your eyes, do this little activity. And I want you to think for a second about what in life brings you joy. Maybe it's quality time with family or friends. Maybe it's holding the hand of a loved one. 
Maybe it is watching a Duke basketball game. Maybe not for you. Maybe it is <laughs> maybe it is listening to music. Whatever it is that you're imagining right now, let that emotion, let that memory and that emotion just fill you up with joy, okay? Breathe in and just breathe with me, okay? Yeah, it's a good feeling, right? Okay, you can open your eyes because what God has already said is what you're experiencing on earth, which brings you joy, I'm going to completely blow out of the water any expectation you have about heaven. It's a place that will be brand new, but it's a place that no one can conceive what it will be like. Brand new, brand new, okay? A place of joy. The third, third one is this. If you're going to take a picture, now's your chance. Uh, the three points about heaven there, okay? And I, and I want to take a sidetrack here and, and, and give you this little sidebar while you're taking that picture. I'm not up here today to simply give you the answer. Any good teacher knows that if you just give the answer to the test, no one's really learning anything, right? Not here just to give you the answer. What I, what I am up here doing is, is giving you answers that are found in Scripture that maybe you've asked these questions before. Maybe you have people in your life that are asking you these questions, and maybe you've thought different things about them, and this is kind of, like I said earlier, debunking those thoughts. Wherever you find yourself, remember, it's, it's about the process of answering the question. It's about jo- joining in the conversation with people who are curious. Okay, so keep that in your mind as we go. Heaven will be a place of worship. Now, we're not going to read all of 4, 1 through 11, but I did want to give it as a reference. We're going to jump in partway through in verse 6. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, and the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So the main thing I want you to understand here is this. I want to grab hold of those creatures that were talked about. Okay, imagine, if you will, a hummingbird just hovering around the throne and its wings flapping so fast. It's just there. It exists. The thing that's so interesting about that creature is that it can never take its eyes off God. It's covered in eyes. So when one on its left wing closes, the other one on its left leg may open. Okay, whatever the case may be, it's constantly focused on God who sits on that throne. And that's what's so important. Because I'm often asked, what will heaven be like? And this is my go-to. It'll be a place of worship. It'll be a place where we can't help but worship God. And at the very, very least, we worship him, church, because he deserves it. <laughs> he deserves it. And so when we're in heaven, it's not going to be, uh, you know, I, I say this, maybe it will. Again, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can conceive. But it's not going to be just constantly running around eating ice cream and having conversations and playing basketball or whatever Whatever you thought your joy moment was. I, I believe that those facets of creation will be there, but, but if you look in Scripture right here, it tells us that everyone there worshipped God. They couldn't take their eyes off of Him because He deserved it. So let that comfort you today because... Heaven will be a place of worship. Now, I want to change gears a little bit here and start talking about hell, okay? Um, so there are a few things that, growing up myself, I had some, some misconceived ideas about what hell uh, is like or what it, why it exists and things like that. So this was helpful for me. I hope, hope you find it helpful too, but we're going to talk about why hell exists. The very first thing is this. Hell exists for God to deal righteously with Satan, Okay? If you've been around the Christianity any at all, then you understand that, that this is kind of a, um, an, an easy one to understand. But we're going to jump in with that scripture. I want you to see it spelled out because Jesus tells us this. He says, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Jesus tells us that the intent of hell being created was to be an eternal fire prepared for the devil. I just want you to hear that. First and foremost, that is why it exists. 
And the second reason that it exists is that hell exists for God to deal righteously with unbelievers. Now hang on with me here for this point because my third point will help understand some of the context there, but hell exists for God to deal righteously with unbelievers. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 through 9. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. See, in the very beginning of the story of Jesus, Jesus started laying out the gospel, the good news, his life, what he was going to do, and then he died and rose again and went to heaven. From that moment on, people had a choice to either follow and obey the gospel of Jesus or to ignore it. So we have a choice. And in doing so, when you choose to believe in Jesus, to ask him to be a part of your life, or to not, you will spend eternity somewhere. That's laid out for us. There's a very good story that helps identify this for us, and I want you guys, I'm not going to have us read it a little bit lengthy, but I will give you the highlights. And this is one of those, like, if if you have homework today, this would be it. If you're going to write this down, Luke 16, 19 through 31 is where, is where I'm kind of pulling this reference from. I'll say it again, Luke 16, 19 through 31, and Jesus is telling us a story of a rich man and a poor man named Lazarus. And he sort of set the stage, and he creates this picture for us. He says that Lazarus was at the, the gate of this man's property for years and years and years, and he constantly begged and begged and begged for, uh, for food and for clothing and for things that he needed just to simply survive. And the rich man ignored him. And then the day came when they both died, and Lazarus, because of his life choices, because of belief in God, ended up in heaven, in paradise. And the rich man, who did not believe in God and did not, you know, love others and do the things that was asked of him, he ended up in hell. And it gives us this picture. Jesus paints it, and he says there's this great chasm, this great expanse separating the two places, and that the rich man looked across and saw that Lazarus was comforted. All the things he wanted in life, he didn't have, but he had in heaven. And the rich man was living in destruction and torment. And he simply said, if you would but reach out your hand and give me a drop of water to cool myself off, I would be relieved. And the answer was no. You made your choices, and this is where you're going to end up. This is where you're going to be. This is where you'll spend eternity. And so have hell exists as a place for God to do righteously with unbelievers. And this third point goes directly in that. And again, if you're going to take a picture, now is a good time. God does not want anyone to go to hell. I'm going to say it again. God does not want anyone to go to hell. It has never been his will from the beginning of time that anyone would spend eternity in hell. I'm going to read 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow to keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Please read that underlined portion with me, church. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Come on, do it again. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Students, you're not doing it. You guys, just you, right here. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Thank you. Okay? we got to get that ingrained in our minds. Because God does not want anyone to perish. His will is that we would come to repentance. But it falls back on us. It falls back on free will. And that's why there is that divide. So let me give you a little more story into this lesson real quick. So I shared these thoughts on a Wednesday night this past semester in our student ministry, and I had a young man who asked a very, very good question that I did not have an answer to in the moment. And instead of, like, you know, lying or making something up, I said, that is a great question, and I don't know. And for a moment, like, everyone was like, oh, man, that was a great question. We want to know the answer. And it turned into... What? He doesn't know. Yes, we stumped him. That's what all these people did. Don't let them lie to you. They all did this to me, okay? And so I'm like, okay, 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 let's calm back down. Let's calm back down because it is something that I want to explore with you. So after we were done that night, I let anybody that wanted to stay a part of the conversation stay in the room. Anybody else was dismissed. And so this young man and I, we sat down and I said, let's go back to that question you asked. It was a good one. And we jumped in. And some of the things he was thinking about heaven and hell, they were just, they were just misplaced. 
um, fancy word for he was wrong. And so we kind of jumped in and uh, <laughs> I just helped bring some clarity to some of his thoughts. We looked into some scripture and found some answers. And at the very end, I kind of had this nudge on my spirit to say, you know, is, is he saved? So I said, I was like, hey, you know, are you saved? Like, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And he said, well, I believe in God. Okay, that's good that you do. Even Satan believes in God, all right? So how do we help bridge the gap to get you from just believing to Jesus becoming a part of your life and your Lord and Savior? And I said, do you want to pray? And I explained this process to him about, you know, asking God to come be your Lord and Savior and Jesus dying for your sins. And I said, do you want to pray that night? And he looked at me and he said, I would love that. I'm like, okay, let's go. So I grabbed a couple of his friends and brought him over. I grabbed another youth leader and brought him over. And we sat down and we prayed with this young man and he received salvation that night. And right after he got up from the prayer, he said, when can I get baptized? I was like, we have baptism services. I'll get you some more info and we'll, we'll talk about that moving forward. But here's, here's why I tell that story to wrap up this little sermonette here. Do not be afraid of the tough questions. Please, please, please do not. Because by simply saying, I don't know, let's explore that further and continuing the conversation with someone, it will open doors to life transformation, church. I believe that. Had I not said, I don't know, let's explore that, and then followed up and explored this answer with this student, he may have never accepted Jesus. But everything was lining up so well, and the Spirit was moving that night, and it was a great question. It was a few great answers, uh, all from God, not from me. And then I, the door opened, and I couldn't say no. And now he will be in heaven at the end of his life, and it's going to be amazing. And so I want you to just not be afraid of the tough questions to see them as invitations into the discussion. Please do. Okay. This last one here can be a biggie, and I would venture to say that the majority of us in this room have thought this at one point in our lives or are thinking this. It's the question of why do bad things happen to good people? And that's a big one. Um, I gotta let you know, I actually wrote my capstone paper in college about this topic. I've been wrestling with this question since I was 16 years old. Not because people haven't done a great job of guiding me in the journey and the process. It's just something that I've just been exploring for a very long time. And within this question, there are a lot of sort of hidden nuances and hidden uh, subjects that can be drawn out. For instance, um, I made some notes here. It essentially draws to attention the problem of evil in the world. And the problem of evil states this, is that if God is all good, and he created everything in the world, then an all good God created evil. And if good created evil, then good really isn't good, it's evil. Okay, you see how you can kind of get lost in that train of thought? That's sort of where this, this question stems from. It's a very in-depth discussion to have with someone. But more than that, this question includes nuances and subjects and themes like God's sovereignty, which is a whole other sermonette for another time, God's goodness, his benevolence, his omnipotence, and his omniscience. All these things start falling into one. So, so when you think about asking the question that if God is good, why would we have evil in the world? You have to realize and, and explain to someone that God is not just good. There's more to him than that. So there's a few steps that, that I always go through in my own life when I have questions like this that are, that are deep and multifaceted and hit on lots of subjects. And I want to kind of show you that process again to help answer the discussion. Maybe it will be helpful for you, for you today as you've wrestled with that question yourself. The first one is this. Number one, you have to define the evil that you're talking about. Define the evil. Definitions are great. It makes sure we're all on the same page in our discussion. So is it a natural evil or a moral evil? Natural is referring to natural disasters, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, things like that. Moral evil is sin, murder, rape, uh, things like that. So whenever you're talking about evil, what is it you're identifying? Is it natural or is it moral? The very next thing is this. You have to define God because God's going to work in different ways depending on the evil. His intervention is going to be different depending on the evil, but define God. Like I already said, this question is a very loaded one. So what part of God do you want to come into play here? Can we just look at one? Are there multiple? Do we have to look at multiple? There's some questions to follow up, but define the aspect of God you want answered and jump in. 
immediately, and some of these teens here today would be able to tell you I've done this with them, uh, whether they realize it or not, but immediately after God is defined, this scripture is one of my go-tos. Isaiah 55, 8. You have to understand that God is not like us. I'm going to read it for you, okay? For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. Isaiah 55, 8. Now, I don't use this scripture as a cop-out. I got to be honest. When I, when I was exploring my own faith in this question and, and, qu- and things like that, and these other questions, I, was, I ran across the scripture, and I'm like, well, that's not good enough for me. It's not good enough for me. I want an answer, okay? I felt like a 12-year-old. I wanted it black and white. What's my answer? And I realized that there's a level and an aspect of knowing God that we have to come to terms with, and you have to in your own life, at some point, you have to come to terms with God being mysterious. You have to. I'm not not giving you a timeline. What I'm saying is if you're going to be able to move through tragic situations in your life and tough questions in your life, you have to realize that God's thoughts are not our human thoughts, and his ways are not our human ways. And there's a level of understanding that we will never fully be able to grasp. We can try, we can pray, we can explore, we can, we can uh, talk to God, we can read our Bibles, but at the end of the day, there's a level of God that simply will, will our, our human minds can't understand it. So I don't use this as a cop-out. I use it as another reason to say, remember that God is bigger than we are. The next step I always fall back on is this, to acknowledge the reality and power of Satan. In Luke 13, chapter, or verse 16, Jesus tells us this, he was healing on the Sabbath day, and he was called out for it. This is what he says. Then, then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whose Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? Sometimes you'll be, you'll be asked the question, why did God do this? It's God's fault. Why did God do this? Church, I want, to hear, I want you to hear this today. Just like the song we sang a few moments ago, God is madly in love with you. And just like you as a parent would never uh, intentionally break the heart of your child if you did not know what was best for them. If you don't intentionally break their heart, then it is something else that is in this world that is working against them, and that was happening in this woman's life. She'd been bound by Satan, not by God, by Satan, and Jesus acknowledged that. Another example, if you want to look in your Bibles, is the story of Job. (laughs) Satan came up to God and just said, hey, I want to go uh, wreak havoc on this guy's life. His name is Job. Will you give me permission? And God said, go ahead. Again, God's mysterious, okay? So he went down, and he put him under all these trials and all these tribulations, and Job continued to put his faith and trust in God. And he had questions. When you read the full 40 chapters, 41 chapters of Job, he had lots of questions in that journey. But each and every time, he praised God for where he was. Because he knew there was a level of this where, where he couldn't understand because God was mysterious. And, and I want to kind of jump sideways with this because I, I don't see Satan as someone who um, always goes and asks God's permission like he did with Job before intervening in the world. But we do have to understand that he does have power and dominion in this world. He's been allowed that by God. And he's working against us. The next step is this. And I love the... Oh man, the, the poetry of the story of Lazarus, when you really dig into it, in John chapter 11, Jesus loses his best friend. And if you know the story at all, you know that eventually he raised Lazarus from the dead. But there's a lot in the middle that, you, that can get lost in reading the story if you're not focused on it. Because Jesus had the power to heal Lazarus. He had the power. He had the ability. He had done it countless times. And in Tyler's mind, it would have been easier just to walk over and say, be healed. And he's done. He's up and he's walking around. He's moving. Life is good. But he chose to wait. It says in the Bible, he waited. He chose to wait. Word came that Lazarus died, and while Jesus was on his way to meet with the family, he wept. He wept. Now, I'm asking for a bold step here today. Anybody want to claim the fact that they are an ugly crier like me? Any ugly criers in the room? Oh, some of y'all. Mm-mm, mm-mm. No, I'm talking like snot everywhere, mascara running, like dry heaving because your body's working so hard. Okay, guys, Jesus ugly cried on that day. And it wasn't just because he lost his best friend. Hear me on this. Jesus journeyed to the town, saw the heartbreak in the family 
because of Lazarus' death. And I think in that moment, Jesus had a very human moment. Again, he was 100% God and 100% man. I think he had a very human moment, and he realized, I could have stopped this. I could have stopped this. And my action had a consequence, and now they're hurting. And Jesus wept with them. Church, if you've ever struggled with this question, if you've ever struggled with the problem of evil, please don't think that God is so lofty and far-fetched and away from you that he doesn't experience the pain with you. Please don't think that about God. He journeys with us in this life. And then Jesus, like I said, he does heal Lazarus, and there was celebration, and everyone was happy again. But I always go back to this when I when I think about this question and this, and this topic because Jesus modeled for us. He showed us what a spiritual heavenly father couldn't, and it was this, that God walks with us on our journey each and every step of the way. Okay, the next step, the final step is this, and you can take a picture of this slide at this point, and that is Romans 8, 28. Many of you have heard the scripture in your life. Some of you may have, have, have heard it kind of misrepresented in your life. Um, it's going to come back on, but I'm going to read the scripture real quick. It'll come back up. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. Uh, guys, go ahead and get that to the slide so people can take that picture. Um, and we know that in all things, God works for the good. Now, here's where I've heard it misrepresented is that in all things, God makes things good. No. God can't take something that's completely evil and undo it and make it good in that moment. What he does say, just like Jesus did, is hang in there with me for a few more minutes. Give me a little bit of time. Journey with me. Don't let go yet. Hold on. There's something amazing I'm about to do, and I can't fix this right now, but I'm going to make it good. There's going to be an outcome that will be good. Jen, my wife, I have her permission to tell this this story. Um... She had a friend that she lost in middle school. And this young man's name was Ben. And let me tell you, uh, no, no pastor wants to do that funeral. That's, that's tough. Now, I'm kind of outside the narrative at this point. Like, me trying to imagine putting myself in a leadership position to do that funeral would be very, very, very difficult at the loss of, of a junior high student. But it happened nonetheless. And because of Ben's testimony in his life, the church was packed, overflowing with kids who came. And because of the testimony of his mom and his sister on that day, countless lives of teenagers were changed and transformed, and even some getting saved because of Ben. Now please, hear what I'm saying. God did not take Ben from this world. It's not the God I serve. God did not uh, plan... The ultimate plan was for Ben to lose his life. I don't believe that. Okay, this is Tyler speaking. That was not God's will for that young man to lose his life. However, what he did in the middle of that journey was to say, watch, don't close your eyes yet. Hang in there with me because I'm going to make something beautiful out of something tragic. And because of that testimony, multiple other people got saved that day. That is the story That's the underlying theme of this question of why do bad things happen to good people? Life doesn't discriminate. Death doesn't discriminate. It happens to us all, good times and bad. It's what God can do through the struggle and through it that transforms things. As we get ready to wrap up today, church, I want to share this, um, kind of this word of maybe, maybe warning or caution to you if I can. And this is, again, personal experience that I've lived with this. Be cautious of, of certainty, okay? If you try to be certain and have the right answer to every question in your life, it will harden your heart. You will become so uh, focused on being right and being correct and knowing the heart of God in the wrong way that you're going to miss out on the relationship and the discussion that follows after that. Okay? I've been there. My, my life has been spiritually drained and dry because I was more concerned about being correct and being certain that I knew the right answer instead of just knowing that God was with me in the process and the journey. God is mysterious. We cannot forget that. And I have one last story as I close, and that is this. Many of you know the story of uh, Liam, my son. And he was born... Um, 
he had it was diagnosed with infant sleep apnea and was in the hospital for uh, quite a few days as they were determining what it was and how to treat it. And uh, he was like an old man. He needed a, a oxygen machine everywhere he went. And he's just this little baby, okay, days old. I was so mad. I was so frustrated. And many of you in this place, many other people in our own life, for my wife and I, did a great job encouraging us. But the answers weren't good enough for me about why this was happening. It wasn't good enough. God, why? Why? I was caught in the middle of being certain of wanting the answer, right? You guys have been there, right? I was caught there. I'm like, God, why? And why can't I do anything to fix it? I'm his dad. And I was so caught up in that. But I got to be honest, church, I hung in there. There were hard days. There were some better days. But I hung in there. And ultimately, in about um, it's a year ago this month, yeah, a year ago this month, um, we got the good news that Liam was completely healed of his sleep apnea, and we didn't have to worry about him falling asleep and not breathing anymore. And I got to be honest, church, I hung in there, and it was because of the doctors and medical science, I fully believe that, that helped heal him. But there's one person in particular who Jen and I are so thankful for, and that is her mamma. Because this woman prayed day and night for the healing of our son. And when there were days where we couldn't, she did. And church, that's what it's about. More so than having the right answers, be in the conversation, and above all else, fill your heart with Jesus. You all should have gotten a card when you came in. Okay, if not, there'll be in the back on your way out today. I want to walk you through this. On one side, it says a solid foundation at home. And this is for you, okay? It's okay to say, I don't know, and let's explore that together. Please, 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 please rely on that. It is very important. It's okay to use those phrases. The next thing is this. Never forget, remember Isaiah 55, 8. And in your own time, in your own journey, come to terms with the fact that God is mysterious. Realize that for yourself. I can't give you that timeline, but I pray that that, it, that will occur to you. And these next two are very near and dear to my heart because the foundation for your kids being able to healthily explore their faith in the world today has to start with John 13, 34, and 35. I want to read that to you. This is Jesus, a new command I give you, love one another. Now, notice, he didn't say, let me go back and read the Pentateuch. Let me go back and pull out Genesis. Let me go back and look at Deuteronomy. He says, a new command I give you, love one another. Church, we've got to help our kids fall in love with Jesus first. Before they can healthily explore the rest of their spiritual lives, they have to fall in love with Jesus first, and then they have to understand that loving others like Jesus loves us is the next step. Before convincing someone that their way is the right way or that they have all the answers to the Bible or every, anything else, it comes down to being in love with Jesus and being in love with others. And the second verse is just like it. Uh, the Great Commission, Matthew 28. Go ahead and give me that one, guys. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. I'll stop there. And teaching them, okay? And teaching them. Once your kids love Jesus, once your kids love others, then they'll be equipped to answer questions when, when people ask then they'll be equipped to explore more and more with you at home on a healthy foundation. But always, always, always beat the drum for that foundation. Please keep that as a help to you. Again, one of the ways Pastor Liz and I, one of the reasons we've approached this whole series is we want to help parents win at home. We want you to win because when you win at home, you help us win at church. So please, please hold on to those cards. On the back of that card, just some helpful resources. Uh, the Bible obviously is a, is a good one, I think. Make sure you have one of those at home. I mean that sarcastically and for real, okay? Um, churchandculture.org, great resource when you're looking at different blogs to help with discussions. Uh, the One Minute Apologist is a YouTube channel. Look that up on YouTube. He has some great little two and three minute uh, conversations he has with people about different topics, and they get pretty deep. Uh, Robbie Zacharias, I mentioned him earlier, let me people think. And then finally, your, your staff, your pastoral staff, we love you guys. And if you have questions that you help, that you need help exploring, please come talk to us. Final thing I want to say today is this, and Jesus told us to go love and to go spread my name. 
We have a group of people that next week get to live that out. Uh, so my Toronto kids, if you guys will come on up and stand in the front. Church, as we wrap up today, I want you to help us pray and lift up our students that are going to be on this trip, and even, even the adults that are going there too. Um, come on up and file across here, guys, right across the front. We have a few that couldn't make it today, um, some of that were in first our first hour, but this is a good portion of our group. So today, church, before we kind of get to our prayer, I'm going to ask if there are any pastors and elders in the room, if you will please come on up. The Bible tells us that when we uh, anoint others and lay hands on others in, in prayer, that big things happen, and we need all the prayers we can get because next week we get to be a part of a community uh, that is primarily Hindu, Muslim, and Buddhist. And when we leave next Sunday, we're going to that community, we're going to help lead a day camp and a VBS for these kids. And just like we saw on the screen, we're going to be sharing with them the love of God in a kind, respectful, mature way. So please pray for us. Uh, I do have a couple of people that I want to come up. If you are stu- if you're a student volunteer, uh, you work with our student ministry, come on up and help pray for our kids as well. Come on down. Any parents or uh, brothers and sisters in the room that would like to come over and pray for some of our kiddos, specifically your kiddos, come on. That'd be totally fine. And then um, finally, uh, the rest of our teams, I want to invite you guys, if you're comfortable, if you'll come up because we believe in the power of prayer and uh, what better way to live out what we've already said today in uh, as we get ready to go love the world. So we're going to have you guys come up and pray with us. Okay, so church, if you'll please stand for me. Um, God's Spirit is moving in this place. I just ask that you would reach out your hands uh, straight in front of you. Uh, Scripture tells us that, like I said, when we anoint others and lay hands on others, big things happen. So rather than everyone crowding this space, if you'll just stretch your hands forward, I believe that the power of the Spirit will move through this space to just challenge us uh, and and, and encourage us before we take off next week. And and Rod Rowe is going to say our prayer. Bow your heads with us. Precious Lord, we just lift up the name of Jesus, Lord, and we thank you for all that you've done, and we thank you this, uh, for how we see you working in the lives of these young men and women, Father, and we thank you for what you're going to do. Lord, we ask that you give them safe passage, Lord, that you just anoint them in a mighty way, Father. And God, make uh, open their eyes to the possibilities, says Jesus, working in the lives of others, Father. Lord, help them just to see the opportunities that you're going to grant them. Father, we ask that you give them safe travel there and bring them home back to us, Lord, for the adult leaders going with them, Father. Encourage them and bless them, Father. Lord, we pray for Brandon's leg, Father, that you bring a healing touch to that as well. Set him free, Father, so that he's able to go as well, Father. And Lord, we ask this all in the precious name of Jesus because of the great and wonderful things you've done and by the blood and by what you did on the cross, we can give praise and glory to your name. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.